Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. That's, that was my coping mechanism, was if I get ahead of it, no one will make fun of me because I've already done it. And there's no yeah. worse thing that anyone else can say that I haven't said to myself. Um, but yeah, you know, because it's one of those things, if you can hide, hide your pain in laughter or if you can, um, you know, show give the outward opinion that you're not phased uh, you know it's it's survival it's kind of all yeah. what it is it's survival. high school is just survival <laughs> really yeah it can be for sure for some people absolutely you, we, so you mentioned that you cruised through school but it wasn't as simple as that as you went down the track was it no not at all so it was one of those things where i was just i was very very lucky that yeah, that, that I did, was able to do well, and then it hit a point where it wasn't. It was a point where, unbeknownst to myself, that my ADHD began to present itself. Um, How and uh, you know the, everything that I'd mentioned in terms of these were things on my report card. They just started ram ramping up, right? So the the challenge is when in as as a teacher you would know this like you can you'll you'll be watching these kids and you'll start to notice when the ones are starting to fail or flunk or starting to fall behind and that is normally when the detectors kick in and they go oh, especially back in the day they go aha we need to help this kid what are they needing but if you're sitting at the top and you're doing really really well and then suddenly you start falling and you just end up in the middle ground they go ah oh, he just wasn't as good as we thought he was. Our expectations were too high. Mm -hmm. He's just, he's an average kid. So, you know, and then because I was able to then get through on the averages towards the end, none of the They've things- They've done their job. They've done their job, tick, cool. Like, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, why did he go from there to there? Hmm, wonder what that is. Is that a like your loss of potential, whatever, whatever. Nah, he finished, tick. So I just kept going, mm. you know. Yeah. Hope that answers so, the question. But I mean, you got, you got, well, it does, yeah. But you, you got into university. You, mm. you, nobody can just jump on a science degree. So you must have been doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Like I did, did fine, you know, um, mm. in my way is one of those things that now in hindsight, I, I thought about, you know, uh, one of the, yeah, so one of the things I've done in the last couple of years to really sort of help build myself is the power of reflection. Um, it's, it's, it became a painful word, uh, yeah. that, you know, the amount that I, that I do it, but, you know, I look back at my time when I was studying and like, what are the things that I use to keep myself going? Um, whether it be, you know, listening to music while I studied, my parents used to kill me for that. I, I you know, but I'm like, no, no, but it works. Like I put the headphones in, I can focus on what I'm doing. I'm not even really listening to the music, but when I start getting distracted, the music replaces that. And I go, oh, the music. Oh, cool. Oh, what I'm writing. And like, it becomes mm. a grounded distraction compared to suddenly I'm staring out the window and like, hey, what's over there? You know, but because I didn't get diagnosed until I was what, 32. So, you know, I, it's all these little things that I, that I taught myself or when it came to, you know, I'm bad at taking notes. So what I, what would I do? I would write the notes and I would read them out loud because I'm, I'm an oral listener, right? Uh, sorry, oral learner. So like for me, it comes through in like, I have to hear it for it to make, why I love podcasting yeah. um, or conversation, right? So that's what I would do in classes instead. I, I have to admit, you've kind of just taught me something there because I've never really agreed with the kids wearing headphones because it never used to happen, right? But it's only mm. in the last X amount of years since I've been teaching, I've really noticed it more since I've spread myself around the schools, go to 40, 50 different schools. And I, I always, I, I, I study the brain and I, I, we, through my studies, um, I've realized that when people talk about they can do more than one thing at once, you might be able to physically do it, but it doesn't mean your brain capacity is doing 50-50. You know what I mean? You can't do two things at yeah. once at 100% capacity. I think that goes without saying that's mathematics. Absolutely true. No, that's more, right. yeah. Yeah. And when I look at, I dive deep, quite deep into ADHD and people think it's a deficit disorder. Well, it, it's, I don't believe it's a deficit disorder. What you've just said there, it's an overload disorder. So it's Correct. not the inability to focus on one thing. It's the inability to focus on more than one thing. Yeah. And what you just said there, where the music acts as a barrier, I actually have changed my whole perspective mm. on just from that one sentence. Because I'm like, guys, what you don't need music on to stay focused. Now I get it. Mm. Now I know what 
Well, it is that the music can actually keep them in a shell, I suppose. So yeah. then if you're if you have the ability to do it, but not listen to the music, like what you said to your mum, mm. I believe it was. Was it your mum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was your mum. Uh, uh, yeah, I like that. I've never looked at it like that before. So maybe that's what the children can't articulate to me is that yeah. it acts as a barrier to stop looking and thinking about yeah. the things that are going on around them, right? Well, yeah, to expand on that. So, like, yes, yeah, so it's, to, it's to block out the external stimulus, right? Like, it keeps yeah. everything centrally located to me and, and in that moment. So, it is, if I find myself, uh, you know, I'll start, you know, tapping the beat, whatever. So, therefore, I'm I'm being tactile. I'm, like, tapping my fingers. Like, you know, there are certain, you know, there's most definitely things you can't do while listening to music. Like, if the teacher's talking to me, not yeah, happening, yeah. but like yeah. it's when I'm when it's time to study, when it's time to take notes, when it's time to read a textbook and do and do my whatever, whatever. That's when it comes in. But it's Andy, also yeah. something that expands outside of that for me. So like when I go to bed, to the detriment of my of my partner, I like to listen to stuff because it quietens the noise in my head. Mm. You know, the the downside of myself for context as well. So my, I am uh, what's called combined ADHD. So I'm both inattentive uh, and hyperactive. I, I have the the bit of paper that I got says I'm a 97% chance of ADHD with a 3% margin of error, which means either 94% or 100%. So I'm essentially the textbook definition of ADHD. Um, so yeah, like there's always a thousand things going on any minute of the time. And especially towards the end of my day when the, when the you know, the incredible, um, you know, the medication wears off, everything goes loud again. So like to have, especially when it's try when I'm trying to sleep, like having that, is it just noise? Yeah, kind of, but it gives me a focal point. So as even I've got my eyes closed, I'm focusing my attention onto something, which then allows the rest of my body to calm. And then mm. I go to sleep. It's the same way that when I drive to, you know, I'm driving to various wrestling shows over a weekend to help reconcile my anxiety and center myself to go and be in front of a mic or be in the middle of a ring or whatever it is I'm doing at that show, listening to these podcasts centers me and it balances me out so that I can walk in without that jitter. So I'm like, oh no, I've had the things that I need to, 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 to chill. Yeah. I learned, I've learned a lot in the last five minutes on that one. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad we discussed that. <coughs> Excuse me. You, so anxiety then you get anxious in those moments of where you shine. Um, mm. I get that. I, I've done that and get anxious even though I do believe down, deep down I'm pretty good at what I do, but I still get anxious leading into those moments, whether it's teaching in a new school or even starting a podcast episode. Like a couple of hours before, I get a little bit like, ooh, I've done this a million times, but oh, I'm yeah. feeling a bit, you know what I mean? Um, but it's always been successful, but it still appears. Um, maybe that's passion and caring for it, I don't know. Did Where did anxiety start for you then? Was that from the bullying um, no, uh, the dip in the education, go, being top dog, top dog in academic, but then being an average kid. Where did that for, come from? For me, I think my anxiety comes from a bunch of different places. So, uh, for additional context, just to add to more of a list of things about me. Um, so, I was born six, seven weeks prem. Um, and I was very sick because of it. So, I did right. spend a lot of my formative years, like ages zero to four in and out of hospital right so there is all there was always a baseline of anxiety around around my, my childhood years right yep, that's um, trauma on the mind and the body in itself absolutely isn't it? um and it's one of those things like you know with my with my psychologist whatever they like talk about you know moments of trauma i'm like i don't have any clear moment of trauma but i've got a bunch of small ones that just you know <laughs> sprinkle their way across my entire existence so that's fun mm. um and then of course yeah the school stuff as well that's always an anxiety driven thing and um and then the you know ev everyone talks about this as someone that does come from an accelerated um space is that that expectation right is that especially within my family pardon me like my mum specifically not to call her out but she she'll admit she hasn't really done everything that she said her, her mind to when she was a kid she hasn't achieved everything she set out she's achieved a lot but not everything so as a result she would she kind of pushed me um you know to be like you could be the one that didn't you know the one that did the one that didn't do what i couldn't you know whatever the expression is so the idea is that i was you know very driven to achieve 
Um, and of course that has this huge lingering anxiety, which then spread totally into my life for the, for the rest of my life. Like everything I did felt like it wasn't enough or that I could have done better or, you know, oh, just this fear of just, you know, I've, I don't think I've sworn yet, but just this fear of fucking up, you know, it's just, it's always there. And like your, you know, my default position in my life is when am I going to go wrong? Ha have I let you down? You know, that, and that's the thing. So, you know, by extension, like you come to realize that that is such a huge part of being neurodiverse as well. It's just that, you know, that sense of unease. So, you know, to the beauty of that is now that, you know, with the power of Ritalin, God, I swear by Ritalin so much, you know, it drops my baseline anxiety from like 80% where the smallest little thing could kick it over the line to like a 40%. So the things that would previously have made me spin out are like manageable. Like, you know, I, I got made redundant a year ago and cause it happened at two in the afternoon, right in my peak riddle in time. I went, Oh, okay, cool. What, what do we do now? What's next? You know, compared to like two years before the same job in a, you know, similar space, the smallest little thing I'd be like, nah, this is dumb. I hate it. I met, you know, like, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So mm -hmm. It's, it's funny how, how anxiety in, impacts you and, uh, and affects you in a number of ways. Cause you know, by, by definition, anxiety is, it's an irrational fear. Like it's things that you shouldn't be worried about. Like I, you know, I used to have fear of a public speaking where now I just don't care. Like, you know, I'll walk into the middle of a ring and stand in front of 200 people and be like, Hey, how good's wrestling? And I don't care. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's. It's great to be on the other side of it as well. But now my anxiety just presents in different ways, you know, which is lovely. So how do you think you jumped over that fear? What would have presented itself two years ago, jumping in a ring and doing what you do now? How, how, you, how would you say you've jumped over that hurdle? Yeah. Well, self-understanding is the big thing, right? Like I don't, like a, I, it is a big, the big throughput of, of what we're discussing here today is you know, for many, many people, when they discover their diagnoses, whether it be a mental health challenge or whether it be a neurodiversity, many of them see it as a shackle, right? It goes, oh man, this, this limits what I can do. But for me, I look at it and I go, oh man, this limits what I can do. But in the way that I work best when there is a fence. If there's a framework around it, like I can, you, you give me absolute freedom to work within that fence but there's a fence. So for me, getting the, getting my diagnoses rather than going, Oh my God, I've wasted 32 years of my life. It went, Oh man, I have this information. I now know why I do what I do or why I think the way I think. So let's take that and make it better. So like, okay, I now know that I get fidgety. So what am I doing right now as I'm talking to you? I'm standing because I'm grounding myself to know that I'm not going to like swivel on my chair and be an obnoxious little, you know, 11 year old in my, in my thirties. So I found my way to ground myself, um, you know, or when I do get anxious, one thing, you know, in, in almost a weird, beautiful mind-esque fashion, like I will visualize the things that are making me anxious in front of me in, you know, like a list. And I break down all the beats that, that are making me anxious. And then, you know, cause it, you know, panic attacks come in waves when you don't want, you know, they come in and then they go away and they come in, they go away. So what I do is like, when I'm in that heated moment, I list all the things that are making me anxious and then it dissipates. Then it comes back and I go, ah, is it on the list? It's on the list. We have an answer for that. Go away. You know, and those little things is what's helped me to come over that, right? So even <clears throat> down to, you know, doing my, you know, Steven, yeah, so standing here talking to you or doing my, my work in, um, in the wrestling, you know, I might get a little bit anxious before I go out into the crowd. I'm like, well, hang on. You've done this how many times? You know, you don't get bad feedback because wrestling has this really cool thing where either, well, it's not really cool, where they, they, no one ever tells you you're doing a good job. You just hear when you're doing a shit job, which is good because if you don't hear nothing, sweet. Um, so like for me, that was kind of difficult. I'm like, I'm not hearing anything. No one's telling me I'm doing a good job. Not that I need, like, you know, yes, I need the external validation, but just that affirmation to go, ah, yes, I will keep doing what I am doing because it is ticking the box. Um, you know, so I go, well, no one's pulled you up. No one said, don't do this. Don't say that. You can't, I go, oh, well, I guess I'll just keep being me. And I think that's part of it as well, because like, especially in the job that I have now and everything that I do, I kind of get paid to be me, which is a really, really cool 
thing to do. Like I got hired in my job because of my work with the brand prior as an ambassador. So they hired me for my personality and coincidentally my skill set. I work in a personality driven format. Um, my, you know, that helps anxiety is the honest answer. Andy, uh, like I mean, if, if you don't have to have that seed of self doubt when you go, no, 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 it's more like you are more than fine. They are, they, they, you're doing this because you like, God damn, it's one of the, once you have that moment and you can settle with that moment, God, it's liberating. I mean, how many people go to work and actually feel like that though? In reality, <coughs> some people enjoy their jobs, but are they the true selves? You know, we have, we live in three lives, don't we? You know, the mm. public life, the private life and the secret life only secret life, meaning you only know your thoughts in your head, <coughs> whether it's, they're wrong, naughty, whatever. Mm. You've got a private life where only your partner knows, yeah. right? Then you've got the public life. But how valuable is it to go to work where you can just actually be valued in being yourself. See, that's one of the other advantages, right, is of, of at least way, the way my neurodiversity pres presents itself. I'm incapable of being anybody else. Like, I could never, be an, I could never be an actor because I can't be somebody else. Like, I'd, I'd be a really good job of, like, Michael Sarah, you know, people that are, like, absolutely typecast. Like, they only ever just do them. I'm like, sweet. If you, want, if you need just me, beautiful, you get it. You want me to do anything else? Not happening. And, you know, for a long time, that was a, a, a sore spot for me, right? I'd be like, oh, man, like, I don't want to be me. I want to be somebody else. I'm like, well, no, I can only be me. The only thing I can control in this world is me. So learn to love me, find my strengths, and for lack of a better term, exploit them, right? And you found a job in it, man. That's fucking well, that's, awesome. That's the thing. Like I said, I, I love video games, so I made a job out of video games, right? Whether yeah. it be the content or my previous job. You know, I love wrestling, and then I made it a job. Now, is that just is that me shaping my world to find an excuse to do the things I love? Absolutely. But, you know, if it has an advantage, like if you love what you do, you know, there is that expression, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's totally false. If you love what you do, you work even harder. Um, and you... Mm -hmm. you Kill yourself in the process, but mate, I agree with you because that's reason why I'm doing lead hour away. You know, I don't know if it was a cultural thing coming to Australia, being me, being talkative. I've always been known as the talkative kid and the talkative guy, getting out there, being everywhere. I was actually quite shy in primary school, believe it or not. If they knew I was a teacher, they'd be like, really? "Oh, I was incredibly shy until like." Yeah. Grade four, so I'm absolutely with you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, basketball brought it out of me. You know, I was fairly decent at basketball. Done a few things around Australia and coached and whatnot, and it kind of brought it out of my shell. Anyway, talkative guy, high energy, out there, quirk. No, I wouldn't say quirky, maybe, but um, you know. But I feel <laughs> you. You can feel it. Like people don't answer your phone call because you know they're going to be on the phone for an hour with Andy. <laughs> oh man, so, see that. People avoid my messages because I don't text because my brain, like my mouth, like I voice message people because voice messages are the best. I, one of the things that I fear the most and I feared it for years is being misinterpreted, right? Because, you know, all, all the years, you know, you, you said one thing, the tone was taken the wrong way because you just spoke, not realizing, right? Mm. Um, so voice memos, I think are incredible because A, it removes any sort of, um, you know, Mis mis tone, mis mis context. Yeah. If I tell and I go, yeah, but if you get a message, just goes, yeah. <laughs> so like, am I like really happy for you, or am I just going, yeah? yeah you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, that, like, I love that, and like, I've converted most of my friends into voice memos, most because they know they won't get a text from me. So, <laughs> but I, I, I'm with you. I, like, so if any of my friends are listening to this episode, I, voice I'm memo not... people. Yeah, well, or, well, I'm on to you. Text messages are shit. I'm phoning you even for just 30 seconds. I can get, I'm a big boy. If you need to go, you just say I need to go. It's yeah. okay. You know what I mean? But it, it it just offers a little bit more love and oxytocin doesn't just to hear somebody's voice and just connect with them. Even if it is for a minute because you've got a life and you've got kids and you need to move on. Great. But answer your goddamn phone. Well, yeah, and like as, some, as someone that talks in a thousand tangents, like there's only so many commas I can put in a sentence. So like be able to, <laughs> you know, have a different thought and you can hear where it's going, like big win. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, again, going back to your previous point, like with the podcast, I get to talk, I get to meet new people, I get to learn, and I have nobody looking over my shoulder telling me how to do it. Perfect. If I can do this full time, all the time, I am 
the happiest guy on the planet. Mm -hmm. I just need to improve my studio like yours. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, you said before about uh, anxiety coming out in spurts now. In, so you've, it feels like you've con I, what I'm taking from your words is that you've conquered anxiety in certain parts, but it's coming out in other uh, in spot areas. What, what are those spot areas now then? Um, so we haven't, we haven't touched upon it yet, but we'll, we'll touch upon it now. So yeah. I had what I refer to as my, my, my rock bottom, my moment of, of, of trauma. You know, we, everyone has that one thing that shapes the rest of their life. And for me, that was in um, November of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so it was my birthday, the 6th of November, 19, uh, 2000, whatever, 2021. Um, and that is when I had the conversation with my now ex-wife about where things were at. Um, and <clears throat> in short, I was incredibly unwell. Um, so much so that without even realizing I was this cancerous, toxic presence and I was like draining the, the happiness or ev everything around me. I was just this void of just shit. It was a lot of undealt, uh, you know, undealt with stuff from COVID because I didn't stop working during COVID, working mental health services. We never slowed down. So I never really got to like properly process this massive impact on the world. Um, and then of course, also discovering my neurodiversity as well and sort of dealing with that and, and finding all those things and then realizing that, you know, if I wanted my both my ex-wife and, and my son to, to to be happy i needed to do something and i needed to fix myself and you know the conversations were like well what if we do it together I'm like no no no, this is going to be brutal like i know where i'm at and i'm not well and it's going to be a slog <clears throat> what what was it that made you you say unwell talk about unpack the unwell word for us what do you mean by unwell? By un I mean mentally unwell, like it, it, the, the short of it, right? So I was horribly depressed. Um, I was incredibly anxious. I was just overall unhappy. And it wasn't to the fault of, of my partner at the time, like my ex-wife. Like, um, you know, she herself is now going down her own path of discovering her neurodiversity. So for, you know, and we're doing it together, which is bizarre. You know, like we're actually better friends now than we ever have been since it because of a bunch of different things, but like that, you know, everything led to that moment. And like, because, you know, her and I failed to communicate properly because, you know, now that I know, like we had, you know, different love languages, right? Different communication styles. And, when we first got together, like 10 years before that, you know, we both chose to look over some of those things because we loved each other and we, and we were just happy to be with each other. And then over time, and you know, the, those little gaps become bigger and bigger, or those little scars, the little scratches start adding up. And, and, you know, then like the, the, the introduction of our son put a massive impact on, on our house. Um, not in a bad way. <clears throat> I'll explain that. Please, this is where I comma and tangent. Um, so, due to my complications of being born so prem, um, some things had to happen. Some surgeries had to happen that resulted in me having a vasectomy at the age of three to save my life, essentially. Um, so, we were under the under the uh, understanding that I could never have a child. Simple as that. Um, you know, so X amount of years, you know, I, I did the test and the test like, nah, it's like, sweet. All right. Hey, uh, you know, you still want to be with me? And she's like, yeah, sure. Of course I do. And then it was one of those things where we got married <clears throat> and then what would have been three months later, four months later, um, my ex-wife, I'll, I'll say her name. Her name's Millie. Um, Millie goes to me, Hey, I've missed my period. I'm like, that's weird. Like because of her stress and her anxiety, she would just miss it occasionally just because, you know, it's connected to that. I went, you should do it. You should do like a pregnancy test. That'd be funny. So she did it and it came back positive. I'm like, mm, this is not funny anymore. <laughs> um, so she did another one. <clears throat> I was like, shit. So I'm like, okay, we're going to have to have a very serious conversation here because there's three options. It's mine, but we have medical documentation to say that it's, that that's not possible. It's somebody else's. Or it's your body, like you've got some sort of cancer or tumor or something that is tricking your body to think that you're pregnant. 
Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.